I have an issue with $70 games. Not because I'm anti-price increases, if they have a valid reason for doing so, but because it ends up falling on the consumer who ends up having to take on the cost of doing so whilst companies show record profits. Over a decade ago, a game would cost $50 brand new, and now that's how much they end up discounting them down to. Not only that, but they have overpriced DLC, with season prices to get a load of cosmetic changes, and will show this and ram it down your throat at every single given opportunity to try and get you in the store. Modern day gaming has become becoming nothing more than money first and quality games second. We're even now getting into the stages of NFTs and $120 games that are being floated around as ideas, however, enough is enough. Yes, all of those are massive issues within the modern day landscape of gaming, but to use that as a blanket statement and not do a deep dive on the underlying reasons as to why we're here would be a tad misleading. So let's sit down and discuss the case against $70 games. Just before though we jump into the underlying reasons into why these price increases have been going on, if you'd like to join a like-minded group of people who love games and talk about pretty much anything and everything, then make sure to come over and join the Exiled Ones Discord. While you're heading down there, you can hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you love watching video essay content like this around games and topics within the gaming space. Lastly though, if you do want to support the channel any further, make sure to come check out the Patreon. You can support for as little as $1 a month, but if you want to get early access to videos like these behind the scenes and a special role in my Discord, one one, one chats with me and the ability to have input on future videos, make sure to join the Exiled Ones tier instead. Now though, let's dive deep into $70 games. One area that I see a lot of people starting with when they want to have this conversation is discussing the history of price, however I'm not going to be doing that. I understand that by definition in the past games cost way more than they do now, however I do believe it's a flawed argument to just say you have it way better now than you did back then as a reason to dismiss any reason. If we follow that train of thought, companies like Rockstar saying that they want to charge by the hour for gameplay would end up becoming a reality, which means more and more people would be pushed out of this hobby. I understand why people want to use this argument, but it doesn't help us into today's landscape. So if you do actually want to watch a video about this topic, there is tons of different videos if you just search up why were games more expensive in the 90s. The next area to get out of the way is my thoughts on microtransactions and DLC, as this is something that you need to understand if I'm biased towards whether or not I like them or not. My general view on the likes of microtransactions is that they can be done right. I can see why a lot of people do hate them, and I do hate many types of them, but for me to explain this properly I need to compare two games. One does microtransactions correctly and the other one does them terribly. The one that does microtransactions right and is the pinnacle of doing it is definitely Fortnite. I know, some will probably hate the fact that I just said that, but there's a reason why this game has been able to stay afloat and it's because they have really cool skins that everyone can get into. Whether you want to be Ezio winning a battle royale or you want to be a transformer and become Optimus Prime, then you can. It wasn't just crossovers though, even the skins that they had within their battle passes, especially in the past, were really cool. They do battle passes right with the ability that if you pay once, as long as you actually get through all of the tiers, then you'll be able to get the next one no matter what, which is actually a good thing. You pay and as long as you end up playing the game, then you'll be able to keep enjoying those rewards. They give you something that either genuinely looks cool or resonates with you in some way, and it's all bundled into the game that is functionally sound and free to play. Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 on the other hand came in at $70 as an upfront cost, with a battle pass and tons of microtransactions. Again, I'm not necessarily anti those things in particular, or necessarily that title of $70 game to jump into it. I'm more anti the way that Call of Duty goes about it. They're struggling with every single release, either with gunplay being awful or the maps being absolutely trash. They've dropped the content that people used to love and just focused on making their games as dopaminergic as possible. The battle pass is always shown to you and the microtransactions are rammed down your throat. But the biggest issue is that they're just trash. They look awful and rarely does anything stand out as being cool. Make good micro transactions that people won't mind spending £10 on. Don't do what Call of Duty do, where the skins just aren't that good looking, or are just variants of others, and they're simply overpriced. In the realm of DLC, I do think two things need to be ticked off, which is that the extra content is genuinely extra content and good content, and then the other one is its pricing. CD Projekt Red are probably the best at this. They release great DLCs, normally 30 to 50% of the value proposition of the main game, but at $10 to $20. This is something that is actually done right. 
When you have a DLC that let's say gets compared to the likes of Phantom Liberty or Blood and Wine, then you know that you've done something amazing. Some games do just class their DLCs as extra microtransactions, which is a bit of an issue for me, as I'd like to see more of a bigger distinction and more of an emphasis on companies making expansion packs instead of DLC. That has nothing more than microtransactions hidden in behind a DLC that's 5% of the effort that was actually put into the main game. Regarding the topic of today's video, the basic opinion that I have as a surface level take is that if you're going in and buying a game at $70, only you are being screwed over as the consumer, and most of the games that are coming out at $70 are nowhere near as finished as the games that were coming out at $50 just a decade ago. When games were $50, you were able to get games that were completed on release. Yes, they may have had some issues, however, they couldn't actually sell a product that wasn't finished because of one big issue, which was the lack of internet. And obviously, I'm not actually talking about a decade ago in terms of that sort of thing, but when you're talking about the early 2000s to late 2000s, the internet was starting to make its actual impact within gaming, and that's where you then enter into the world of games being released, where they can just be patched later. On top of that, most games that are released at $70 are big AAA titles, and yes, they cost a lot of money to make. But the reason why they're willing to spend as much money as they are is because they know they're going to make their money back. For example, Red Dead Redemption 2 cost $500 million to make, and that took 8 to 9 years of development. However, they made all of that money back within the opening weekend, including $250 million on top of that. Not all of that is necessarily profit, as it all does have to be divided up, however, that is one example of what most games are like within the AAA gaming space, which is that they can spend a ton of money because they know they're going to make that money back. So when we live in a world where games are being released at $70 that aren't completed, with microtransactions, DLCs and battle passes, it makes me slightly jaded over the idea of games being at the $70 price tag. But here is my big caveat to my basic surface level opinion, which is that games that are good enough can definitely demand that price. For example, the same game that I said made all of its money back with RDR2 could easily have released $100. Sure, it probably would have been spoken about for that reason, but people also would have purchased it and would have played it and talked about how amazing the story was. An insanely good product can demand that sort of price tag. Does that mean that they should do this? Probably not, because you know, if the game is still going to make all of its money back at $60, then I'd say stick to that price tag. However, that doesn't mean that there isn't a reason for doing so if people have a high enough demand for the idea of playing the game. With the likes of GTA 6 coming around the corner, and then RDR 3 coming later on, knowing just how complete their games are and how much effort goes into them, people definitely would be willing to pay that price. For us to talk about the price that we see of $70, we need to first ask the question, where does it come from? So I want to break down why games are becoming more expensive to make, and in turn, why they're becoming more expensive to purchase. One big thing to think about and keep in the back of your mind throughout this is that the push towards digital gaming was massively strong, for a few different reasons, however the top two was that it was massively functional, because obviously it just means that everything's online, you can download updates and whatnot. The other one was that in theory, the price should go down, especially when you take away the the cost of producing the games and the discs and the cases and whatnot. However, we haven't seen that. We've seen the price rise over the years. But we aren't there just yet, so let's talk about why games are becoming so expensive. Not many games release at $70, but some do, and the ones that do are typically the ones that cost a lot of money to make. It seems justifiable to charge this price, especially when you consider that inflation exists and they haven't upped the price of games in a long time. With that though, the amount of players has also risen by a lot over the last last load of years, with gaming becoming the most profitable entertainment niche ever, and it ends up coming in with around 3 billion players worldwide, according to Nuzu. However, even with all of that, the gaming world seems to be cutting costs with massive layoffs and hiking the prices up while pushing more and more microtransactions. So why are they trying to do all of this? Well, games are becoming absurdly expensive. The most expensive game ever made will be GTA 6, with an estimated $2 billion, which is crazy to think. Many of us loved GTA GTA 5, which cost $265 million to make. So over a decade, the price of making the next GTA installment has gone up by 7.5 times. That scale is around the same for most of these big AAA releases. Obviously, there is give and take to that, but RDR1 cost around $90 million to make, and RDR2 cost around $500 million to make. Black Ops 2 cost $26 million to make, with Modern Warfare 3 coming out in 2023, a decade later, costing $1 billion. Yes, these are all the big names in the gaming 
gaming space, but this is a trend that almost every area of gaming seems to be going towards, and there is a reason for this. Player expectation, evolution, and hyper competition. Over the years, one big trend has always been the case with many games, which is to push towards games being more and more realistic. Assassin's Creed 2 didn't look the way it did because it wanted to be artistic. They wanted to make it as realistic as they could with the technology they had at the time, which led to games like Mirage and Valhalla, which for all of their flaws, they are visually stunning games. This right here is the biggest reason above all else of why games are becoming more expensive. Todd Howard in his Lex Friedman podcast interview spoke about this in particular with the Starfield development. That podcast as a whole is amazing if you want to just learn some behind the scenes. Obviously, it was a year ago now-ish. However, if you want to learn more about this topic, it's a great place to start. This though gives us a basic understanding as to why you could argue the case of games going up in price, in both development costs and for the player to take on. Evolution is another big one. If games never change and they simply stay the same the whole time over the course of a decade, many of us would stop to care. Sure, some of the games from the early 2000s are cool, but fundamentally a lot of them, unless you were playing them back then, are very hard to go back and play now. We've seen so much of an advancement in quality, from a visual and audio perspective, that has come at the cost of the development windows. It's a trade-off that is perfectly understandable, and something that I don't think we can really argue against. The biggest issue that it does leave, however, is hyper-competition. Due to the requirement to evolve on each release, and the development times being massive, it means that games now are being compared to one another on a scale that has never been seen before. When you would compare Battlefield to COD, you would be comparing the quality of the gameplay and the immersiveness of the experience. But now a lot of people first see the graphics and just hope that the gameplay loop is good enough to keep them hooked. So when you have a game that's been in development for let's say 8 years, and it's being compared to a game that's been in development for only 3, but both release in the same year, it can end up leading to some issues. One has the advantage of far more understanding on the gaming landscape in the modern day. However, the other one comes with the advantage of time, which in theory should, and that is a should with massive caveats, should be a better game. All of this has led to games that are going from just a few million dollar loans to entering into billion dollar categories. Which is insane, but it all comes from this idea that if they can put more time and resources towards something, then it will come with great benefits. The other area to talk about as well is the actual price tag itself. That's $70, where does it come from? And how does that money get distributed? Now I'm going to go over this diagram, and it's something that I've been sent by many different people while I've been searching through this topic, and even in my own research on different websites, it's one that always seems to pop up. However, I am just going to say this, just so that I have full transparency about it, I have nothing that fully confirms whether or not this confirms or is the proper distribution of how money is, you know, pushed around. It just seems to have existed and people use it as fact, whereas I can't find, like, solid proof that this is genuinely accurate to the idea of what we're after. From everything that I've seen though, this chart is more or less the rough guidelines that are malleable depending on the game. A member of the Discord called Sawtooth joined me in the research process of this video, and he adjusted some of the pricing for inflation from the games from 2020 being $60 to the games of today being $70. And the games that cost $60 back in 2005, which was very, very few, if any, would cost around $90 today if you're taking inflation into account. However, again, during all of that time, the player base has expanded massively. The breakdown of this chart is the following. 45% of the cost will go to the publisher, which means $31.50 goes to them. 25% goes to the retailer at $17.50. Licensing comes out to 12%, which is $8.40. Physical distribution, such as making, packaging, and shipping the game itself, comes in at 6%, which is around $4.20. And lastly, they set aside roughly 12%, which is about $8.40 again, for any games that are unsold. All of that is to say that you can actually make many arguments around the state of the price, from how the price ends up being distributed once it hits the publisher, and actually going to the actual dev team behind the game. But one big section to talk about is going to be the retailer's cut. That 25%. Now in most cases it seems to be around 30% from the likes of Sony and Microsoft which is something that they charge for the games just being on their storefronts. It's not a particularly uncommon issue as Epic Games for example are returning Fortnite
website to both the Apple and Google Play stores because they had the same issue with the cut that both of those companies were adding on top of things like V-Bucks. In the UK, Sony are being sued for overcharging customers. This is something that to my knowledge is only in the UK. However, if it is true, I wouldn't be surprised if you see this coming up in many different countries and it's definitely something that if it is 100% true that they are overcharging is something that needs to be changed. One of the biggest arguments that I could make towards this idea of overcharging that not necessarily is within the documentation itself is the difference between first and third party games. That 30% cut that I mentioned earlier is something that every single game sold on these platforms has to accept. So in the UK, that is £21. That's a good chunk of change to be losing on top of every single game sales. However, that's not necessarily an issue for me when it comes to third party releases. As if they can argue the case that that is the charge that they use to make a small profit on each sale and the ability for these games to be hosted on their platforms, then I'm fine with them making some money from that. However, we aren't 100% sure how much of that 30% is necessarily pure profit for these companies. And on top of that, even their first party games will charge you that 30% fee on top, which is why even games like Spider-Man 2, for example, are $70 on launch. Now, if you actually think about that for a moment, if you bought either Starfield or Spider-Man 2 on launch at that $70 or £70 price tag here in the UK, which if either one of those were any other game companies would have resulted in a loss of 30% of that price to go straight to the platform. However, this is a first party game. All of that money goes back to them. So when you're buying a full priced first party game on launch at $70, the company is walking around with $50 of every sale. Now to answer the first thing that anyone will use to counter this argument, which is that first party games have massive budgets, but so do plenty of third party games. Why is it that Spider-Man 2 should result in $50 of pure profit for Sony, but then if a game like Power World eventually comes to Sony, and then also what they've got on, you know, Xbox and on PC and whatnot, those platforms are going to be taking that fee on top of it. Best case scenario is that the first party games would be in theory far cheaper than other games in the same space. However, if they did that, they would end up losing out on that $21 of what is effectively free money. And the reason why I say it is free money is that the customers are unaware. They don't know any different of why the games are being priced at 70 as it's nothing different to all of these other games coming out at $70. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that the whole $21 should be axed. I can understand why it's there. It's there because it's their fee to allow distribution on their platforms to their customer base and also the hosting of their games. You might not care about this price, however in my mind they're just charging this because they could easily get away with with charging it instead of releasing a product that's a little bit cheaper. It's a win in the hearts of players and a win for the company's reputation. However, they just want that little bit of extra money on top of it. This issue stems from a form of monopolization. Yes, there are different marketplaces, however, most people aren't just selecting through all of these different websites because half of them just nobody cares about and the other half looks scammy, which leaves you with a few options. Buying from a store like Amazon, for example, that could either ship you a code or the product itself. But if you're a part of the 89.5% of players who bought games digitally over 2022, then you're probably going to pick up games off the likes of Steam, Sony's PlayStation Store, and Microsoft's Xbox Store, and the Nintendo eShop. Considering right now that Sony is the dominant player in the gaming landscape, it means that you could probably assume that most of their players are purchasing from their store. The reason that this is important is that you who is watching this video might be aware of all of these other websites that you could go to and get games for a cheaper price, but most players don't. Most players are going to just pick it up from the console's main store for two reasons. One is the reliability. They don't have to deal with the factor that they could end up being scammed or losing out on their game key on the likes of G2A. And the other is simply convenience. These companies might not have a legal definition of a monopoly over where you can purchase their games, but they have a monopoly over the minds of most of us, where we can purchase the best games and therefore able to charge as much money as they want on top of it. So not only could games be decreased by roughly 5% due to the factor that 10% of games ever sold in 2022 were physical, but you also have the factor of the licensing fee on top of that that the platform will take. So Sony and Xbox are taking 12% on top of that 30%. So not only are the platforms gouging 42% of these games earnings, but they are still charging everyone a flat fee. These first party games on these consoles are being sold at 42% extra on top of the average indie or third party publisher. So games like Spider-Man 2 in my opinion should 
never have been released at $70. Sure, the games might not be making their money back instantly or at all, but fundamentally, it doesn't matter. And the reason for this is that for the most part, these games, yeah, these companies would like them to be something that makes the money back, but fundamentally, they are puff pieces. They're things that exist to just bloat the numbers up to make the idea of getting a PlayStation or getting an Xbox or playing on PC a better option, to make it look better for the player. If these games didn't exist and Xbox didn't have theirs, neither party would have many legs to stand on when it comes to this idea of which platform you should play on. If I was being reasonable, I would say that they should charge roughly $50 for these games releases. I know that might sound like an awful thing, but when you consider that $8 they normally charge is licensing fees, $21 of that is the platform fees. I don't think that it's unreasonable to say that they could easily be something way more pro-consumer instead of doing sneaky business tactics of $70 games simply because they can get away with it and nobody knows any better. We can't talk about the prices of games without talking about the biggest change that's happened over the last few years of gaming and has become an integral part of every single game. Whether it's mobile, switch, console or PC, whichever game it is, they probably have a form of in-game monetization. We have many different types of in-game monetization, however I want to focus on two main forms of it. As these two in particular are very much rampant within games that are either free to play or even many of the $70 releases, which is battle passes and in-game purchases. The first of which caused the normally just static releases of DLC drops to become a seasonal approach. Battle passes utilise many aspects of FOMO, with timed seasons through to the idea that you're getting way more value for money than you actually are, as you only have to spend a small amount of money to get access to a ton of different stuff. However, the reason that I'm mentioning battle passes is that they've clearly become what many companies view as a prime earner. They are able to utilise people's desires to spend small amounts of money and also spend way more time in the game as possible, as they don't want you to end up walking away feeling as if you've wasted money. As I said earlier, I'm not necessarily against battle passes, especially when they are done right. So games like Fortnite does this right, with cool skins that actually look unique, but mainly that you can get the entire thing back so that you can keep getting the next one as long as you put in the effort to play through the whole thing. You also have the fact that Fortnite is free to play, so it makes a lot more sense. Whereas many companies will charge for a battle pass on top of the payment you've already made for their game. You'll be pushed towards this with every single game that you finish being shown what rank you've gone up to in their battle pass. This here is one of my bigger issues that I have with it. As you can have a game, let's say like the future releases of Call of Duty, which sure, you might be able to get this game on Game Pass eventually, but let's say you're someone who is paying to play it on Xbox. You pay the $70 fee that you're already giving a massive chunk of that money to Xbox directly, but on top of this, you're giving them even more money because of the utilization of tactics used to grip people in and buy more and more. This is definitely a criticism that can be laid on the feet of far more free to play games, but considering many of the big games out there that utilise these practices aren't free to play. They require some form of upfront fee to get into them, so we can use the same arguments here. When you see something like buy it for only $1, which might sound amazing, but it's simply a fish hook. The moment you end up taking the bait, you open your mind to spending way more money. I know you might not believe what I'm saying right here, but it's something that even mobile games in particular use to utilise people's psychology to try and get them to spend even more money. If you want to learn more about this entire idea, check out how mobile games are designed to scam you by Mr. Who's the Boss. The short of it is that if you spend $1 to get something within their game, you end up breaking that mental barrier. Even if you won't spend $100 right away, you might do over the next 6 months in small little purchases. The reason that I'm bringing all of this up is that these things are all pushed within these games that cost an upfront fee that for many people is a decent chunk of change to have to set aside for these releases, but on top of that, it's just bonus money that they're collecting because they simply can. And I'm sorry to say it, for anyone who wants to defend Call of Duty's $70 price tag, then you're doing nothing more than allowing yourself to get screwed over. When you consider that games like Fortnite are free to play and are really successful, yet a game like Call of Duty tops the charts every single year and has a ton of normal people buying into microtransactions, but also whales who buy tons more than the average player. So not only is the new Call of Duty release $70 at the time of recording this, it will soon be pure profit for Xbox for the most part. They've already sold in just 
their second quarter of 2023 alone, 1.7 billion in microtransactions. So when you're trying to tell me that these games need to be released at the full price of $70, I don't think so. I know that I'm using an example that is considered unusual as not every game is the new Call of Duty. However, it is one of the best selling games every single year and has been for over a decade now. So it has a massive impact on the gaming industry and people's wallets throughout the year. So for now, I want to talk about the companies behind these games, the platforms and the profits so that we can get a clearer idea into how the money and where the money is being made. The first company that I've mentioned a couple of times throughout this video, but I wanted to talk about it as I think it is a good example, which is RDR2. The amount of people who haven't played this game is beyond surprising. Even though this game is massively popular, boasting itself over 57 million copies sold, that game cost around 500 million to make. And that frankly is really cool to see that a game that costs 500 million to make did result in the actual idea of what the game is, which is 57 million copies sold over that time. It just proves how much of a great game it is. And RDR2 is a game that definitely deserved to be released at a $70 price tag if it was released today. However, when it was released, it was released at $60. And within the first few months of release in 2018, the game made $1.3 billion. Within the first two weeks alone, it made $725 million, which means the game made back as much as it cost to make and more right off the jump. Now, what I would like to mention is that I can't confirm anywhere or kind of find anything that's states that that 725 million is pure profit slash money that goes directly to Rockstar's pocket, so I can't really guarantee or tell you anything concrete on that. However, if let's say we're being conservative, it means that the game would have almost cleared the cost of this game's release within two weeks of launch, and by the end of 2018 it would have surpassed it by miles. So no matter what, this game would have made back its money extraordinarily quickly and made even more on top of it. So this gives us a little bit of an idea into how companies are betting on themselves and their games to hopefully make a good amount of money, as all businesses should. Obviously though, this isn't every single game, but as I've gone over in this video, that doesn't really matter considering the types of games that are charging this sort of money. I wanted to talk about the company behind Red Dead 2, which is Rockstar, however, the company behind that is Take-Two Interactive. They're the most valued company across almost every single metric. However, the big thing that I want to point out here is that their numbers of year-on-year -year profits aren't that particularly special. A lot of these big studio stats look very similar, which year-on-year -year profits that are breaking previous years. It's insane, especially when people try to argue the case that these games should be coming out at $70. This is the same issue that we saw with many oil companies during the last few years across most countries, which was the ability to just hike up prices because they can, not necessarily because the increase of demand happened, but because they can and they had a stranglehold over the acquirement of oil. The reason that I'm using both oil and gaming in this example is that both of them have a level of a stranglehold over the general market. Over the last few years, gaming and oil have had a very similar experience, showing record high profits but laying off staff at massive rates and increasing prices even more. I genuinely don't understand how people can argue the case that these games being released at these prices are actually a good thing. However, even with all of that, one of the big points that I've been trying to focus on within this video is who is charging that money and why, because that is particularly important. The reason I've been so focused on Call of Duty is that it's one of the most popular releases, if not the most popular game almost every single year, so they have a massive appeal to the broader market, but they're still charging $70 and charge tons more with a load of extra microtransactions. As I mentioned earlier though, to ensure that we're not going full on just hatred towards Activision Blizzard, I do want to point out that again, around 40% of the overall money is being taken from them and taken to the platforms themselves, so it does make it a little bit harder for them to make money. However, due to that big issue of the 40%, it does make it hard to hate it entirely. My issue with them isn't necessarily the $70 price tag, it is the fact that combining the $70 price tag with outrageous microtransactions is incredibly scummy at least do one or the other, but not both. There is two other areas that we need to talk about to get a full overview of this issue. So let's spend some time and talk about the free to play model.
More and more games are becoming free to play, which is nice to see as it means that people who actually want to just enjoy well-made games and not spend a ton of money on doing so can get them. However, it's not the answer to this problem. Free to play is a lovely model for many of us. If you want to check out a game without taking on the burden of spending a load of money to do so, then you can. Or if you're someone who lives in a country where the $70 price tag is translated into half of your income, then I can understand it entirely. And fundamentally, free to play models allow people to play decently cool enough games like Fortnite that are technically sound and give you a good experience. So with all of those great things, why would I say it's not a good idea? Well first of all, it means companies have to take a ton of risk. Their game will rely on microtransactions, and if they aren't getting enough coming in to keep the game up, they're just going to take it down, they're going to stop caring about the servers and stop putting any content out there. As someone whose earnings rely on viewers and active watchers, it does make me fairly aware on a small personal scale as to how this could affect just one one person, let alone an entire company that's relying on their game remaining popular over a long period of time. That company could be small or it could be big. Either way, they need to find enough money to keep the servers up and keep the game in development. So after everything I've been saying, what do I really think is the answer? I don't know if I have the exact answer, but I'll give it a shot. I believe for the essence of gaming to not get worse and worse, we need to find some form of return to added content that brings value. This is something that companies have been able to get away with for a while now, with only adding content that is really surface level in value, and rarely anything more than just a skin that you can't even sell. What I mean by adding value is something like DLCs that we saw within The Witcher 3, Cyberpunk, and Skyrim. And for multiplayer releases, it's the likes of Forsaken and The Taken King from Destiny. All of those DLCs that I mentioned added a lot to their games that they were being added to, and never felt like they were overpriced or as if they weren't worth playing. Those DLCs were targeted at lower prices, with some of those multiplayer ones from Destiny not even being that particularly low, but people were willing to pay it because the value was there, and on top of that, you could see how much effort was put in to those releases. I also mentioned earlier that I don't hate microtransactions like skins, however I'm extremely against tactics and choices in how they go about selling them and the types of skins themselves. From skins that feel like nothing more has been added than the general basic skin that you could have got for free anyway, and the ones that are just slightly tweaked to make you feel as if you're getting something new. I know one of the most common responses to this video is going to be, if you don't like it, then don't buy it, which is very simple as an answer, however, when it comes to a broader concept of money within games, it's not that simple. And it's a fine strategy for anyone who has control of their own money and is really disciplined in doing so. However, a lot of these games are also targeting kids, and they know they are, even if they don't want to admit doing so. They want to use the malleable minds of kids to try and get them into purchasing stuff, whether it's gems on Clash of Clans or XP boosters in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. We need to have far more ethics within gaming microtransactions than there is right now, which is really sad to say, as I know it's never going to happen. Now though, that $70 price tag. As of right now, I believe that most games that are released at this price tag don't need to be. With only a few being justifiable, those being single player games that have zero microtransactions built in. As they aren't attempting to extract every little inch of money that you have left in your wallet to give to them. However, even with that, I do have some issues with the likes of first party games, as they could be far cheaper than they are right now, but due to the unknowingness from the public, they know that they can profit as much as they like, because these products are insane on the surface, and obviously they cost a lot to make, but they're obviously made making way more profit than the average game out there. Sure, some games especially recently have started to cost too much, and in turn, make it really hard to make money, however, that shouldn't fall onto the customers. This brings me to something that I know people are going to dislike me saying, is that companies need to stop acting like over-the-top investors into Silicon Valley, and focus on following a better budget for their games, and if that means smaller games, then it means smaller games. If it means having less staff to work on a game, then it means having less staff. If a game is going to take longer, it means the game is going to take longer. And if that means, like we've already seen over the last year with a load of layoffs, then it means layoffs need to happen. As much as it does suck to say that people will need to lose their jobs in this process of resetting the gaming industry, it does also suck the fact that people are being pressured more and more with in-game monetization tactics to get them rammed down your throat to spend even more money in their game on top of the $70 release just because they don't understand how to handle themselves when hiring staff 
off in the first place. Instead of Xbox funding companies hundreds of millions to make games that fundamentally are just there to charge you cosmetics, allow a smaller tight-knit team that all share the same vision of what's being made, allow passion to actually fill the void of what's been missing this whole time. You might not get the same number of sales on paper right away, but it will allow you to slowly water the seed that is different games and studios to a point where you'll have tons more variety, and instead of ripping people off with terrible microtransactions, you're going to be giving them franchises that they grow to love. The only issue with everything I've just said is that this answer will never come into fruition. The reason for this is that these big companies are simply on hamster wheels. The same as the likes of Apple and Samsung. If those companies don't release new phones year on year, even if the improvements are tiny, they'll lose out on loads of money, which is really easy for them to make and profit off of. However, if they decided to take a year off, it'll look awful for shareholders and on that piece of paper for people who want to invest in their companies publicly. Without strong leadership in the gaming space and a company that comes along with 95% of the things done right which would be growing sustainably, making great games and having no predatory microtransactions and focusing on the player experience, then we won't see these changes being made. The only company that has done this almost to a T is From Software, which is coming from someone who doesn't really care about any of the Souls games, Elden Ring, or any of, I believe it's the Sekiro games. Outside of that, we have Rockstar, and even then, they tick the boxes for some, but not all. Sadly, until we see a change on a bigger scale, these big companies and even small studios will continue to do the same thing, which is charge people way too much for skins, ripping off customers just because they know they can. Is the answer indie studios? Maybe. But if I'm honest, I kind of doubt it because you need indies to completely rival AAA games. And I know indies have been growing in popularity with three amazing games coming out already over the last like half a year, which has been absolutely amazing to see. And even being able to take on the likes of Call of Duty in terms of pure sales numbers. However, again, it doesn't matter when Call of Duty are making a casual 1.3 billion. I don't necessarily know if this is the answer that I've laid out, or if that there is a answer to this issue. But one thing that I do know after looking at this topic for the last like three weeks is that I feel incredibly mixed. I wanted to end off this video on a good note, as I always try to do, and I always try to find a silver lining, but I can't this time. I still have the same opinion on a surface level that 90% of these games that are released at $70 shouldn't be there in the first place. But I also understand why they are. I understand how some of these games aren't making the money back instantly, but I also feel as if it's incredibly wrong to be putting that on the consumers, for the lack of competency in these companies to hold themselves accountable and hold themselves back from spending way too much. I am worried about the future of games. Not because of the reasons that I've laid out in the previous videos, but the fact that gaming is becoming more and more expensive. It's no longer a hobby that you can simply enjoy without spending a ton of money. Though Xbox is hoping that Game Pass will solve this problem, but that's for another video. If you want to get into console gaming at this current stage, you're looking at a minimum of £500. If you want to pick up a few new games every single year, you're going to be looking at spending a couple of hundred pounds as well. If you want to end up getting a brand new controller, so that you can play co-op, or simply put, so that if one runs out you can swap over to another straight away, you're going to have to spend another 65. If you want a decent headset to run alongside that, you're going to be looking at another 80 to 100. All of that sounds like small expenses. However, when this is all stacked up, it becomes more and more expensive. That's not even taking into account the amount of money that it costs to get into PC gaming. My setup is something that I've upgraded over time. I've been playing on PC since I was about 13, so it's been a good amount of time now, and I've splashed out quite a bit over the years, with my setup costing me around 5 grand. All of that is just so that I can end up playing a lot of the games that I want to play on full specs and record it all at the same time. The worst thing though is that we're nowhere near done with the price increases. Sure, you might say that $70 isn't going to move anywhere for a little bit, and I hope you're right, but I would probably guess that we're going to see some games coming out at $80 within the next 3 to 4 years, after everyone has been bullied into submission of the price of games now. You have the fact that Game Pass used to be £10 to join, and now it's 13 a month? Sure, 
that's only a small amount, but when you consider that over time, this will only go up, with other subscriptions entering into the gaming space with PlayStation's version just a couple of years ago, and every other company jumping on this bandwagon, and even other companies like Netflix jumping into the space of subscription-based gaming. We had Ubisoft just a few weeks ago saying that we need to be fine with not owning our own games. All of this is a push that in the end will mean that we'll probably end up playing on 5 to 10 different £10 a month subscriptions to gain access to a load of games, but only play a small amount of them. And on top of that, we've got Two Take saying that they want to charge by the hour of playtime. We're entering into a time where there might be more players than ever, but in the future, many won't even be able to afford to join and actually enjoy this hobby. The ones who can't will be forced to play free-to-play games that are going to be pumped with so many little things to buy through microtransactions, that provide zero value and utilize the same psychological tricks as gambling machines and social media algorithms to get you to purchase. With that all being said, I hope you enjoyed this video. This is probably the only video that I've ever made where I finished the script and just kind of felt a bit just sad or down. Not because what I found out didn't match what I believed in the first place, but because I don't really see it changing from here on out. The only people who are going to lose out is going to be the customers. And those customers are the ones who fuel these companies, because where else are you going to be getting your games? Unless indie games do truly rival AAA or AA, then we're probably never going to see this happen. The same people who probably just want to jump on and enjoy Call of Duty or play the next chapter of Red Dead 2 after work, but won't be able to because they'll be so out of pocket that it's not even worth picking these up when their games are costing the same amount of money as fuel, and now you have to make the choice of whether or not you want your next paycheck to go towards filling up your car or playing games. If you did enjoy this video or resonated with it in any way, then please leave a like and subscribe to the channel. If you want to support the channel any further, then make sure to check out the Patreon where you'll get early access to content like this and the second channel's content. For anyone who doesn't know, I've launched a second channel, Chatting with Exiled. Go over to there if you want to check it out. I made a video revisiting Red Dead 2. You can ask me anything as well over on the Patreon, join the special group within the Discord, and have input in future videos. And make sure to join the Discord if you're not already in there. It will be linked down below as well and with that all being said hopefully you guys did enjoy this video if you did make sure to leave a like do subscribe and i'll see you guys in the next one have a good one